Hello and welcome. My name is Christopher Deming and I'm with Northwood University. I wanted to welcome Professor Matt O'Connor for joining us today. He'll be speaking on navigating chaos and uncertainty. Um, I will not go too far into this, let him introduce himself, but I wanted to thank you for joining us. A couple of housekeeping items. Uh, this is being recorded. The PowerPoint will be sent to you after the fact. If you are interested in asking a question, please use the Q&A tab, which is on the right side of the screen, and we will uh, work to answer those at the end of this presentation. So without any further ado, please welcome Professor Matt O'Connor. Okay, thanks, Chris, and I apologize for that. I was supposed to kick it off, um, uh, so thank you for hopping in there, uh, and welcome, everybody. I appreciate you spending some time uh, with us today. Uh, like Chris said, my name is Matt O'Connor, professor at Northwood University, specifically in the DeVos Graduate School of Management. Uh, I'm super excited to be talking today about navigating uh, chaos and uncertainty. Clearly, there's a lot of that going on in our world now. Um, and it's important for us to, I think, come together and make sense of what is happening, not only in our, our world right now, but also to learn from it and learn some techniques or approaches that we could apply to potentially similar situations moving forward. So that's really what I'm going to focus on today. Uh, I really want to do a quick shout out and thank you to the alumni services folks at Northwood, Chris, Julie, and Lydia, uh, for organizing these weekly uh, webinars with our family and community here at Northwood. I think they're terrific. Um, I've tuned into them. They're, they are valuable, engaging, and hopefully you'll feel the same way after you finish up uh, the session with me today. And I noticed before we went online, some of my former students are in the, in the chat box, so it's great to see folks here. Um, and please let me know if you have questions moving forward. Um, just what we're going to talk about today for the next half hour or so is around uncertainty and how to make sense of it and provide clarity. And a quick uh, note that I'll reference uh, Beth Bryce's presentation from a couple weeks ago on working from home was terrific, and I'm learning from that. So uh, I live outside Midland here uh, in Michigan, and in my neighborhood today is trash and recycling day. So if you hear loud rumblings and what sounds like a jetliner, it's really just our garbage truck coming by. They usually come between 12 and 1, hoping they come a little later. Uh, but if you do hear that, bear with me, and I apologize in advance for that. Um, I'm going to start talking a little bit about, um, you know, why are we talking about navigating uncertainty? Like, why did I pick this topic? Why did we choose this topic? Well, um, it's a... Uh, it's an incredibly relevant uh, environment that we're in. And from a leadership and management perspective, and that's where I come from. So at DeVos, the graduate school, I teach leadership, I teach organizational behavior, uh, culture, communication, as well as some strategy and marketing. And leadership and organizational stewardship in this environment is particularly daunting. Um, and you know, there's a lot of uncertainty out there, but we still continue to need, we still need to move forward with our organizations in a lot of different ways. So I'm going to talk about how we can do that as best we can in uncertain situations using specific approaches or ways of thinking to get us there. Um, just a bit of a definition. Um, I teach leadership at Northwood. Uh, I tend for this particular talk, the next half hour or so, I'm going to be spending I'll be using the words leader, leadership, leading. Um, I know that there are differences between those two, but I tend to use them interchangeably or synonymously within the context of this presentation, um, because we do know that leaders come in all shapes and sizes, all different forms, informal, formal, ones in positions, one with personal power, those sorts of things. I'm focused more organizationally, leadership broadly, regardless of where it stands uh, or where it sits on, on the org chart. Um, so that's just a bit of uh, some context here. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how to embrace situational uncertainty, fundamentals of navigating it. And I'm going to dig a little deeper into one particular approach called sense making. And it's something that we have all done as human beings in ways, but it's also a technique and an approach that we reference in some of our MBA courses that's relevant and applicable in a lot of different settings. And I'm going to walk through briefly kind of a simplified version of how to go about that and what our goals are and how that can deliver clarity in some way to our organizations and the people that we work with. And then we'll wrap it up with some uh, 
questions. Okay, so that's kind of the outline. So uh, embracing situational uncertainty, that's kind of how I titled this first slide. And on the right, you'll see this big infographic called uh, VUCA, V-U-C-A. I mentioned this in class a few times. The environment that we're currently in is incredibly volatile. It's uncertain, it's complex, it's ambiguous, all right? That's a, it's a military term or a military framework that emerged, I think, somewhere back in the 80s to capture how nebulous and how cloudy and how uncertain situations can be. And by situations, they could be our external environment, they could be our competitive landscape, they could be a global pandemic. Um, all variety of different scenarios fit within this VUCA framework. And you can see just by looking at it, um, uh, things move very quickly right now in, in our world. So it's volatile. We have um, a lot of disruptions. The past is not necessarily a good predictor for us. We're confronting a situation that maybe we haven't seen before or experienced before. We're not sure of the way out of it. Um, and there's complexity involved in that it, it reaches all different points and all different spots within our society, within our organizations. Um, so there's a lot of tangles and tangents to it. And then finally, ambiguous. Ambiguity is out there constantly. So this uncertainty, not only because of the pandemic, but also just because of the way that our society was evolving prior to this, the uncertainty is expected to increase, only expected to increase moving forward. Uh, uh, you could, I mean, somebody could argue that maybe, uh, you know, that's not, you know, 100% true. Maybe there's more stability coming. That's fine. Um, my point is that as organizational managers and leaders, uh, the instability, the volatility can come from a variety of directions and we have to embrace it and understand it um, as leaders and as organizational um, change agents, okay? So step one in this process is kind of embrace the uncertainty, recognize that you're in it, okay? And that's not always easy to do. One of the tips that I've learned over the years is that if we are asking ourselves as employees or as leaders, um, has our competitive landscape changed as a result of X, Y, and Z? Right? There's some uncertainty there, situational uncertainty. What will our industry look like in the future? How do we even begin to move forward on our planning process when we don't know what the future looks like? Um, so those are all questions that if you're pondering in your head, you're definitely involved or immersed in some sort of volatile or uncertain or complex environment. Um, and that's a little different you know, when I've done this talk a couple times before, you know, there's a difference between um, this sort of uncertainty and strictly defined like crisis leadership. Um, there's a lot of information on crisis leadership and how to manage through intensity and um, those situations happening very, very quickly. I tend to think of uncertainty and volatility similarly to crisis leadership but not entirely the same way. So I'm gonna kind of use those a little interchangeable through this. And you'll also notice in my sources here uh, in the slides, um, you'll see some sources referenced. Those are uh, additional readings that I put at the end of the presentation if anybody were into um, some of the topics or under the readings that I included as part of this. So um, if we understand and we embrace the fact that we're operating in a situation, we're operating in uncertainty without any um, idea of what the future might hold, right? um, that requires a, a different mindset uh, when leading. Right? It's very different than stable or, I put in quotes here, traditional times. Um, why is that the case? Uh, well, because there are no blueprints right, or pathways forward. There are no roadmaps for us to follow that will provide not only um, a route for us to take out of the uncertainty and into more prosperity, but also um, how to even begin to do that process. So it, required a, it requires a different way of thinking about leadership and organizational management um, strategically. Interpersonally as well, it poses different challenges. These volatile environments are ripe with um, emotions that we don't always experience at work and we don't always interact with or manage um, as managers or leaders. These are things like anxiety, uh, depression, and fear, uh, among many others. 
Uh, and those are some really um, uh, powerful emotions that tend to emerge in uncertain situations and volatile uh, environments, and they can affect our productivity, they can affect our engagement uh, with our workplace, which in turn threatens the survival and sustainability of the organization. Right? So there's some real high stakes consequences in being able to navigate the uncertainty effectively, um, not only from a personal perspective, but also from an organizational perspective. Um, and this, these consequences, the impact of this uncertainty has led to a lot of folks spending time trying to understand how do we lead effectively through uncertainty. I put up a couple books here on the right for you to take a look at. Um, Leading in a VUCA world, right? It's a collection of um, essays and, and, and readings around different approaches. And this uncertainty extends not just to businesses, but it also extends to religious organizations. It extends to uh, educational institutions. So you'll see uh, people trying to figure out the best way to handle that uncertainty as they work through their organizations. Um, the book beneath it, The Practice of Adaptive Leadership, is um, uh, by Ron Heifetz, is is very popular, very common model of leadership thinking um, for situations exactly like this, where we don't have a clear path forward. One of the big takeaways from the adaptive, adaptive leadership mindset is that um, we have to recognize those adaptive challenges, ones that we don't have a blueprint for, we don't know the path forward, and then figure out just how to navigate that. Um, so there's been kind of a, an increase in the interest around um, navigating uncertainty and leading through the process. Um, so but what has that what has that done, right? The, the result of that is we are inundated now with a lot of information, a lot of advice, a lot of um, suggestions kind of on, on how to lead and how to navigate uncertainty. And not all of that is created equal, right? There are um, varying levels of relevance to the information that we read. There are um, various um, uh, layers to it. It's not all created equally. And, what I try to do as a consumer of this information as I move through uh, the uncertainty is try to synthesize, try to um, understand how different pieces of advice, how different models or tools are relevant to the particular situation, and then consolidate it, simplify it, uh, synthesize it, like I mentioned. So the fundamentals, when we look at a, a lot of stuff that's out there, a lot of research, a lot of advice around leading through these times, um, I, this is how I distill it down to, you know, if when leaders and organizations find themselves in uncertain situations, um, they should really focus on two areas, the organization and the individual, organizational needs and individual needs. And though there are many, many different needs beneath that, but some of them include providing clarity, you know, thinking holistically uh, about your organization and your environment as a total system and helping to create a vision forward that's important too, and structuring and developing new processes that match um, the situation. Right? We have to think about that as our organization, as we run our operations. But also simultaneously with that, we have the individual aspect of it. So the anxiety and fear that I mentioned. Um, and interestingly, uh, I didn't add this to the uh, reference page because I just saw it, but the Harvard Business Review is going to do an entire special issue on anxiety and the pandemic, and they're conducting surveys to try to under better understand how organizations manage anxiety and fear as a result of these volatile situations. Um, so if you're interested in that survey, I'm sure you could track it down somehow. Uh, or even I could post it up after, or we could send it out. But so it's it's a really, really important topic, and that's why we have to address that moving forward, because those have a tremendous impact. When people suffer from anxiety related to external events or fear, they tend to slow down, they tend to retrench, they tend to re resort back to what they know, and that stalls the organization, right? The organization doesn't move forward, the organization stops evolving or responding to the environment, which is problematic. And in fact, I saw just another uh, Harvard Business Review piece um, as I was doing some work getting this ready the past couple of days, um, something around don't let uncertainty stall your strategy. Okay, so there's emphasis and there's momentum 
And there's a legitimate reason why we have to continue to move forward, even in times of crisis, even in times of uncertainty and volatility. And, um, you know, Stan McChrystal agrees. So for the alums out there uh, who were around in 2018, um, you might be familiar with uh, our OmniQuest book for that fall, I think it was, Team of Teams by uh, General Stanley McChrystal. He tweeted out recently, I think a week or two ago, the two most valuable traits leaders can show during the crisis are empathy and clarity. Um, and that's consistent, right? I mean, uh, not everyone would agree that those are the two most valuable traits, but I think we could agree that they're very important. And what is unique about it to me is that um, what, what I tried to do with this presentation is a little unique is that to go deeper than just that. So these are the fundamentals of navigating uncertainty, but how do we provide clarity, right? I mean, that's the question. How do we uh, help people in our organizations understand what might be happening out there when so much is uncertain and so much is ambiguous um, because we have to continue to move forward. How do we make sense of a new world where we as leaders and managers and employees ourselves are unsure of what the future holds? We're not quite sure. Um, and that's an enormously daunting challenge. So you, have, so there's, there's no no surprise that all of these emotions emerge in times like this. Um, so from a leadership perspective, it's a matter of first and foremost, we need to recognize that we don't know that situation. I have a quote up here from um, uh, uh, Ray Dalio. Some of you may have heard of them. He wrote a book called Principles. He runs Bridgewater, who's been around a while. Um, basically, believe not knowing um, you have to understand that you don't know the best possible path, recognize that, and your ability to deal with not knowing is almost as important as whatever it is you do know. So that is a, a fundamental component of leading through uncertainty. And I if we translate that or extend that out into behaviors or approaches, when you look at the sense-making and the um, research around navigating uncertainty, is um, like intellectual uh, overconfidence is a threat in navigating uncertainty. Assuming that you are right, assuming you have the answers and all the information, that's a real problem. So we have to understand that we don't, and that's okay, but we're gonna do our best to figure out where we go from here. And how we do that, and how a lot of people do that is through something called sense-making. And I know it sounds like a weird term, but sense-making is something that we've all been doing at some point in time in our lives in various forms. We just haven't really um, assigned a name to it in any way, shape, or form. Um, you know, sense-making, it, it, it's used to help leaders and organizations navigate the uncertainty and the emotional volatility that comes in these times. Uh, it was developed by Carl Weick in the 80s and 90s. He was, I think he was down at U of M at the time, um, defines it as constructing a plausible understanding of a shifting world. Again, okay, it sounds strange. Um, or generating some order, meaning, and understanding of all of the ambiguity in the environment. Right? Uh, you know, that's kind of a broad, vague way of saying, um, when you think about navigating uncertainty and when you're trying to provide some clarity for your people in your organization, Right, um, sense making is a tool to help you assemble a jigsaw puzzle. Right, I, that's the way. That's the metaphor that I use to describe it. So, assembling a jigsaw puzzle, creating a map, or painting a picture. Um, and in the bottom right corner of this slide, you'll see a partially completed jigsaw puzzle. Um, and if you look at it, right, and if you look at it closely, you can see some sailboats. You can see what looks like some water. Uh, maybe some land in the lower right corner, but you also see a tremendous amount of, of blank space or light blue space without jigsaw pieces that fit in there. So this is what this jigsaw puzzle image is in the bottom right corner is what we're striving for with sense making. We're trying to provide a, um, and I'm going to use the word, uh, uh, Wyke uses the word plausible understanding, right? So we're not aiming for 100% accuracy in these times of uncertainty and volatility, we are aiming for some sort of plausible understanding. And when you look at this jigsaw puzzle, you can see, okay, it's something related to water, there's some boats, but there's a lot of piece, pieces missing. Um, but that's okay, because what that does is that gives me 
as, uh, as an employee some clarity, right? Something to look at, some vision to latch on to, even if it's not entirely complete. Um, and that's important for us because we need to do, um, we need to operate and move our organizations forward without the complete picture. Because even if it's, if we just think about it in black and white terms of staying, uh, of, of waiting or moving forward, or so for example, if we think about the, um, our economy, if we think about it in terms of being closed and being open, right? That, uh, those binary choices create a lot of anxiety for people um, uh, because they're uh, drastic. If, if we think about it in terms of maybe we open up partially, maybe we roll it out slowly, that provides some glimpse into what the path forward looks like that people will, will grasp onto and people will start to uh, believe in, and that energizes them in a lot of ways. So sense making is a way for us to kind of understand what is going on in our environment and how that uh, is affecting people. So in order to do sense making, like I said, we've all been doing it in our lives in various ways. If you started a new job, right, you're, you're walking into the office on your first day, you're engaged in sense making, whether or not you call it that, probably not. Um, if you move to a new city or you've engaged in sense making, all right, you're trying to learn about your environment. The steps for sense making are, are pretty complex. There are multiple ones. I like to synthesize things. I like to simplify things. So what we do is essentially we collect information from a wide variety of sources. Right? We study that information. We apply some sort of framework to it to create a story, to create a map, to assemble that jigsaw puzzle, which we then communicate back out to our stakeholders whoever they may be in a compelling way. Um, and that's important too. So sense making is a real legitimate kind of leadership capability that doesn't get enough attention. That's kind of wanted to uh, focus on it a little bit here because there's a lot of information that's out there, like I mentioned, but sometimes it only scratches the surface. And I like to go deeper into particular techniques when we have the chance to, to, so people can walk away with things that they can maybe use in their daily lives. Um, Sense making is rooted in words and numbers. That's what I like to say. Intuition, logic, data, and opinion. It's intellectual. It's emotional. Um, it's to for a, to shout out to Beth again for her presentation a couple weeks ago. You know, if we look at this from a Myers Briggs perspective, I am an INFJ. The exact opposite of that would be an ESTP, and I like to say that both of us could do this. Right? It appeals to a variety of different personalities and leaders and preferences. It's part of a popular leadership model called four, cap, four capabilities, uh, along with relating, inventing, and visioning. It's a cognitive skill, which fits into some of the other leadership models around skills. So it's, a, it's something that we use in our heads. It's a way of thinking, but it's also a way of interacting with people. So it's also a social skill as well. It's a powerful uh, tool for us to capitalize and, hit, and, and leverage in a lot of different ways in our organization. But the larger question is, why do we even want to do this? Why engage in sense making? Um, but that it, it's important because that plausible form, that incomplete picture is enough to give organizations something to hold on to. It's enough to keep fear at bay uh, momentarily or temporarily in our organizations. It, it provides hope and confidence to your external environment, your stakeholders. Um, but most importantly, and I put this in quotes because this is Deborah Acona's piece. Uh, she's at MIT. She talks about sense making as a tool to move from anxiety to action. And that's really what we're hoping for here. We want to emerge from some sort of stalled paralysis into uh, some action and momentum moving forward as we're navigating that uncertainty. Okay. So sense making is a, it, it can be a complicated process. Um, but for me, I simplify it down, like I mentioned, into three steps. Collect relevant information, okay? Um, so the first process, the first point in that is to suspend your personal judgment. What you wanna do is cast a really wide net and talk to people about the uncertainty and the volatility. Uh, but you can't let your own biases or experiences influence you to the point where it kind of compromises what you're doing. And by that, I mean, um, you know, and I'm guilty of this maybe more than a lot of people where I sort of generalize departments and, and things. So I'll say all marketing people think this way or all accountants think this way. 
can't let those kind of creep into your process of sense making. You really just need to approach it as, as a neutral kind of observer of the situation and then try to make sense of it. You need to talk to as many people as you can about the situation to understand how they are making sense of it and what's important to them. Um, as a leader of an organization or a manager, um, you know, it would be a mistake to focus just on your top management team, your TMT, or your set of trusted advisors. You want that net to be really wide. Um, you want to talk to people across the organization, outside of your organization. And I would say structure this too, because this is a double benefit of sense making, is that it reinforces organizational communication. So schedule some of these calls with people that you need to talk to and, and make it part of your one-on-ones moving forward that really helps in, in times of uncertainty. And uh, when it comes to relevant information, like I mentioned, a wide set, a wide variety of sources, like to say you wanna get on the battlefield and the balcony, and that's an adaptive leadership term that Ron Heifetz uses. Basically, you wanna study the situation from a really high level to see the trends that's on the balcony, um, but also engage with your stakeholders and your customers as close as you can to the front lines. That's the battlefield, because all of that information is important and will be different in a lot of ways. And your job as a leader is to start assembling that jigsaw puzzle based on those pieces of information. Typical questions you might ask in this process, you know, what's your perspective on this? How do you think this will affect us, our organization? Where are our stakeholders' pain points? What are our customers most concerned about? What are the scenarios we need to be considering? I get that question uh, sometimes when I do this talk about sense making and scenario planning. They're related but different, um, and, and both of them incredibly, incredibly important and, and valuable in these times. And then finally, where should we focus our energy and effort? Right. Um, so those are just some sample questions as you begin this process. And you, and leaders do this process, and we do this as employees, like when we take new jobs. We spend some time learning, getting familiar with the situation, understanding how things work. But in times of uncertainty and crisis, you know, we can make a deliberate effort to engage and collect information about what is happening and how people are responding to it, interpreting it. So after you've collected all of that information, it is a, um, it's imperative that you need to um, construct that story, start to put that jigsaw puzzle together. And I like to do that um, in three different steps. And this is kind of like my own little spin on it um, in some way. Uh, I spend some time, not a lot, just reflecting on what I've, what I've heard, what I've read, what I've collected. And, um, you know, I didn't mention this up front, but, you know, in the words and numbers piece of it for sense making data, data analytics, that's is such an important piece of this. You have to make sure you understand the math as well. Use the data to your advantage as part of that puzzle. It's a pretty enormous piece of the puzzle, um, but it is a, only a piece of the puzzle. There are other things to consider. You need to look at that um, through all the different perspectives. After you've spent some time with your, with your learning, your information, you're starting to make sense of it, I like to apply some models or structures to it. Right? Uh, how, do we, how do we understand in some way um, what people or how people are thinking about a particular situation? Three models that I've used that we teach, uh, that we talk about in DeVos occasionally, pest analysis that came up front, uh, that was mentioned up front too. So political, environmental, social, technological, I know there are variations of that too. Um, but, uh, you know, when I think of our, our, our pandemic that we're in now, for me, in my own perspective and mine alone, was that um, initially this was a, a, a social uh, uh, concern for me. I was worried about panic, I was worried about chaos. Um, but as it unfolded, my, my concern shifted more towards health. I was worried about sickness in my family and my friends and my loved ones and my coworkers. And, but then simultaneously, we have the economic concerns going on there and that's constantly changing too. So you can see how um, if someone were to talk to me about how I'm experiencing the pandemic here at home, I could, they could take what I say and what I tell them and what I think and apply it in a different framework, like a pest analysis to make better sense of it in order to act on it. And there are different ones that we can use. You can use balanced scorecard. I mean, it's not designed for this sort of thing, but as you gather information from, from key folks and key sources, are we talking about the financial perspective or the customer perspective? Or what about the internal 
learning and growth perspective or vision and strategy, right? So that's just a way of you organizing the information so you can make uh, that picture just a little more clear for the folks on the other end of it. Um, the last one here is four frames that we talk about in our culture class. Um, that's a little nebulous, but organizations come in uh, have a variety of different dimensions to them. And, and the four frames is one way to think about that. Structurally, that's kind of operational. Political is the interpersonal side of it. Symbolic would be like the rituals, the routines, and human resources would be the, the emotions. And so you can use these to kind of triangulate your uh, learning and your position. Right? It, your map is never complete. The story or the puzzle that you're creating is never complete. It should constantly be changing and adapting. Uh, and, and, and Jonathan Williams' presentation last, uh, last week or the week before was spot on, where he referenced um, South Dakota. In the time between uh, his presentation and mine, right, when he gave his, there were not any outbreaks in South Dakota, but now apparently there's a, an outbreak at a uh, Smithfield pork processing plant, I think. And so if I was constructing a map of that situation, I would um, take the South Dakota piece of the jigsaw puzzle out because it has changed in the time that I have uh, processed this. And that's important because in these times of volatility and uncertainty, we always have to be adapting and responding to the environment and changing kind of how we monitor and what we are um, communicating back to our constituents or our people. Um, so Beth Bryce and, and, and Stacy. Uh, Trapani talked about communicating and some of these others. So this is a little, um, I don't want to spend too much time on, on communication techniques, but from my perspective, um, I mean, the whole point of us doing this is to minimize anxiety, provide some kind of clarity in our organization and uh, help us move forward. And one of the ways that we do that is to communicate the puzzle in the, in the sense that we're making of this particular situation. Um, but first and foremost in that process, to me, uh, you have to acknowledge the uncertainty, right? Uh, credibility is an important factor in crisis and volatility. And if you acknowledge the fluidity of the situation, um, I think you'll gain some credibility with the people in your organization. I think folks are becoming, um, employees are, are pretty good at kind of sniffing out um, BS or things like that in organizations. So you have to acknowledge that it's uncertain. You have to acknowledge you don't know the path forward. We're trying to figure it out, right? I mean, and that's the whole point in these situations that there is no path forward. Um, so acknowledge that, all right? That's step one because you don't want to compromise your credibility. Um, when we communicate this, we talk about communicating persuasively using stories, images, metaphors, videos, podcasts, um, all essential, all absolutely relevant. I like to say nothing replaces the individual interaction. So if you have um, one-on-ones with your people, make sure you keep them on the calendar or better yet, maybe schedule more with new people, right? Because in those one-on-one -on -one interactions, you can not only engage in sense-making in that you can learn from them, but you can also reinforce um, a, a lot of the different outcomes that we're talking about and part of it, it, as part of sense-making. And you can also help reinforce the relationships that you have through that one-on-one -on -one interaction, which tends to be amplified in these times. Um, and also like Jonathan Williams mentioned uh, last week, this is an opportunity for organizations to, in, to change. Right? There's an opportunity to do some fundamental structural changes in how our organizations work as a result of this. So third step is to continue the learning process here, to con encourage continued learning and to, um, generate new ideas, to challenge assumptions that have been on the table, and to discuss undiscussable topics. Right? So take advantage of that. Um, key points to communicate after you've gone through the sense-making process. This is what works. This is what we're seeing and experiencing. This is how the situation has changed or evolved. This is where we think it might go in the future. This is what we are still tracking and monitoring moving forward. However, this is our rough blueprint for that. This is how we see the pathway unfolding for us. And those points right there, um, if communicated well, reduce a lot of organizational anxiety, um, mitigate some fear, start to generate momentum, and start to uh, engage more. Um, 
So sense making, although it's kind of a not really a fancy term for something that is pretty straightforward that we do in our lives, it's about learning from other people, processing that, and trying to communicate back what you learn. And if it's done properly, it can be a really powerful leadership uh, weapon, I like to say. Um, like I said, it reduces fear, it moves the organization from anxiety to action. This is what I was talking about with the one-on-ones. It, it, re- it offers hope and personal connection. It gives you the chance to do that as an organization. And it allows you as an organization or as a leader to continue to compete in the market. Stalling or coming to a stop is really dangerous, um, regardless of the times we're in. Um, but sense making is just one aspect of it. When we think about leading through volatility, there are a myriad of different approaches. Sense making is one technique that gets used frequently in these times. Um, some words of wisdom that I'll say before I wrap up real quick. Um, we have to embrace the uncertainty as leaders, as employees, as we can't run away from it. Um, the tendency is to stick our heads in the sand and wait for it to pass. But uh, everything that we read, everything that, that we discuss tends to be the opposite of that. Embrace it, immerse yourself in it, try to figure out a path through it. Over-communicate, that's a basic, um, especially on the individual level. Set boundaries that are firm and flexible. Our work is changing, um, how we do it is changing. Make sure people have the flexibility to be productive, but also at the same time, make sure accountability is still embedded in your organization, that's important. This one is really uh, near and dear to my heart too. I'm a huge fan of learning from experts, talking to other people who have subject matter expertise in different areas. And if you as your organization um, were caught off guard or are not fully clear on on the path forward for yourself, think about expanding your network. Do you have anybody, um, do you have any law enforcement folks you can interact with or mentor or things like that to expand the network of knowledge that you can gain um, through this process? So just to summarize, sense-making is um, a a technique to help organizations chart a path forward while simultaneously kind of minimizing anxiety, and it's important for us to do in these volatile times. Um, You'll see that I put uh, references throughout the the PowerPoint slides here. So these are just the sources that I used if you wanted to go deeper into anything in particular. Particularly interesting to me, uh, the second one um, is is a real like 15 page overview of sense making that's very valuable. Um, you know, the practice of adaptive leadership I think is a book that uh, almost every organizational leader should should own. Um, the very last book, 1997, by White, Sense Making and Organizations by Sage, that's considered the Bible that's considered the landmark publication. So if you're interested in this and learning more about it. You definitely need to pick up a copy of that. It's been around for a long time. You could probably get it for pennies used. Um, And uh, so there, Um, you know, I crammed a lot into that talk, but I wanted to make sure that I addressed things from um, kind of a broader level, but then also did a slightly deeper dive into a particular approach that you can take, um, not only in this current crisis, but in additional or future uncertainty that may emerge. And I want to encourage you, if, if uh, I'm happy to take questions, if you, you want to reach out to me anytime, my contact information is here. I live in Midland. You can call my cell, shoot me an email. I'm happy to chat. Um, I think leadership is inherently a social activity, and I will talk to almost anybody at any given time about their philosophy, their experiences, because that's how I learn about it. And uh, that's how we evolve as professionals. So thank you. Um, Chris, how does that sound? That sounds great. Thank you so much, Matt. I appreciate this presentation. Um, I know we have the overwhelming majority of our people still on the webinar. We are slightly over our original allotted time slot. So I did just want to let those know who are still on the call that if you want to drop off, you will still have access to this Q&A session because this is being archived and will be sent to you after the fact. So if you have someplace else that you need to be, um, if it's okay with Professor O'Connor, I think we will try to field just a couple more questions um, just sure, here. Um, and then hopefully we can answer some direct questions if you have to drop off again. Like you said, you're more than welcome to do so. Uh, first question we have from your colleague, Todd Thomas. Okay. Is there anything specifically that would make it easier for a leader to help their remote team with sense making? 
So that's a um, fascinating question. So, so I think one of the angles that I would study that from is uh, if you were not working remotely prior to this and suddenly you find yourself in a remote situation, um, the technological aspect would be a, a, an important angle to capture in that. Um, when people try to sense make or in some form figure out a new environment, a lot of times they focus first and foremost on themselves. Do I have the tools that I need to be successful? Do I have the physical space? Do I have um, the mental space to be successful? So I think in those remote environments, there is an extra layer of complexity that goes into it. And for me, I would approach it um, with that particular mindset. I want to make sure that I addressed technological component of it in some form, but then also reinforce the communication process too. I think that, I mean, we've been doing a lot of video conferences. Everyone has, right? And there's fatigue on that sort of thing. So I found it refreshing, frankly, just pick up and do a phone call lately and just talk to someone without having the video camera. That was really exciting. Um, so I would definitely engage the technology piece as a potential uh, focal point for someone to tease out if it's problematic or if it's uh, really causing a lot of heartburn for people in their organization. All right, I want to give just uh, one more minute for any additional questions to come in on that Q&A tab. In the meantime, I did want to make sure that I invited you all to join us next week, Thursday at noon, where Kristen Hadid, who is a Northwood alumnus, will be talking about uh, permission to pivot, adopting a growth mindset in a time of uncertainty and change. Uh, she is a distinguished women honoree, and um, we will be, uh, this will be an extension of what Professor O'Connor was speaking on today. Well, it looks like we don't have any additional questions coming in through the Q&A. So with that, I will thank you, Professor O'Connor, for joining us today. We will see you next week for Northwood University's webinar series. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you.